Hello, uh, this is the third lecture in the immunology series. This one is about innate immune cells. I've had a cold for the past week, so please forgive my voice, um, I'm recovering. All right, so this is pretty cool. Innate immune cells. Let me just navigate this. All right, so we're talking about the immune cells that are short-lived and nonspecific. Two of the most important ones are macrophages and neutrophils. If you remember from a previous lecture, um, which of these is more likely to be present in your blood? And it's never let monkeys eat bananas. So it's neutrophils. We're going to talk about how macrophages fight pathogens. That's called phagocytosis or cell eating. And then we're going to talk about what is actually on the outside of macrophages that allows it to detect pathogens like fungus and bacteria. And then if you ever do cut yourself, if you've had an injury, um, it swells up, it's red, it hurts. That's called vasodilation. And we'll talk about why vasodilation is actually quite important and suppressing that could potentially be very bad. And then lastly, um, Oh, I'll have to pull up the video on YouTube, which I wonder if that's allowed. There is a really great video showing immune cells rolling along a mouse um, blood vessel. I wonder if it's too meta or if I'll get in trouble for using their video. I'll just do a clip. All right. So what receptors are required for leukocyte rolling adhesion? Here are some keywords um, I've found in the past that a number of my students found these really helpful. All right, so let's take a look at each of the main players in the innate immune lecture. There are the macrophage. This is one of the most well-known innate immune cells. They primarily kill through eating, so phagocytosis. Um, they have other bactericidal mechanisms. Bactericidal means bacteria killing. And then we've not talked about antigen presentation yet. This is a new term. If you recall in lecture two, the structure of the lymph node and how it had a macrophage area, a B cell area, and a T cell area. So antigen presentation is when a macrophage or below, see here, the dendritic cell, picks up a pathogen, eats it, breaks it down in the lysosome, which is the acidic stomach-like compartment in your cells, and then takes a tiny piece of that and presents it on the outside in a receptor. There'll be many lectures on this. This is the first time I'm bringing up the term antigen presentation. Dendritic cells are similar. Um, these are mostly tissue residing cells that wait to sample pathogens and then take them to the lymph node, which is where the vast majority of antigen presentation occurs. Okay, these two cells function quite differently. These are granular. So remember a concept from before, Macrophages and dendritic cells are agranular, meaning not granule containing. Um, however, neutrophils and eosinophils are granular. Neutrophils are interesting in that they can perform phagocytosis even though they're really short lived. So they do share the feature of phagocytosis with microglia. I often do write an exam question. Um, asking what are the similarities or differences between neutrophils and macrophages and remembering that they can both perform phagocytosis um, usually helps the students figure out that question. They have other bactericidal mechanisms that are very different from macrophages. Eosinophils are primarily there to help kill parasites. And since in parts of the world, like the U.S., um, parasites are not that common. It's thought that eosinophils contribute to, um, to allergy. Basophils and mast cells are also granular. They're granular because you can see all of these small um, 
vesicles that are packed with granules. I think that saying the basophil function is unknown is a little silly. It, it's also involved in the parasite response and allergy, um, but it's not as well studied. Mast cells are one of the most important cells um, in allergy and parasite removal. In fact, um, if you remove mast cells and suppress them with antihistamine, you can dampen most immune responses. So they release granules containing histamine. Each of these purple circles is a vesicle or sphere containing histamine. There we go. And then lastly, we have the natural killer cell. Do you remember which pathway they come from? Myeloid or lymphoid? Yeah, they're one of the three that comes from the lymphoid progenitor cells. So remember, it's just B cells, T cells, natural killer cells. Everything else comes from the myeloid lineage. Just make it easy on yourself. They primarily kill tumor cells and virally infected cells. Okay, this is a lot. Um, I typically would tell my students that this is not the type of thing they need to memorize. Um, but I just have it here to show some differences between the innate and quick responding cells and the adaptive or long-term uh, working immune cells. So they actually have inherited from you, from your parents, um, the genetics of their receptors, meaning the way that they recognize bacteria and viruses is already set. It triggers an immediate response and it recognizes a broad class of pathogens, which is a good thing because the other half of your immune system recognizes a specific class. So it's nice to have both. They complement each other. All right. Um, the next couple lectures, when we go over B and T cells specifically, you'll see this happening. Adaptive immune cells are more complicated. They are encoded in multiple gene segments and they require gene rearrangement. You'll see how many times a B cell has to rearrange itself before it can make a functional antibody. And a lot of the B cells don't do it correctly and they just die. All right. So now I've gone over the images of the main players and now I'm gonna layer on some detail. So the neutrophils are short-lived. I think of them as first responders. They're a little bit like EMTs. Uh, so they're about 40 to 75% of the white blood cells in your blood. That's a good thing because of how quickly they respond to pathogens. They contain granules, hit that home a number of times, um, and they can also engulf infectious agents and self-destruct. So if you've ever popped a pimple, I mean, most people are guilty of this at some point in their lives, um, you might have thought you were getting rid of bacteria, but you weren't. Pus is usually bacteria that's already been killed by a neutrophil. The white stuff in pus, those are self-destructive neutrophils. Yeah. Think about that the next time you're considering popping a pimple. Natural killer cells. Um, they mostly defend against viruses. There'll be a whole lecture um, about how they fight cancer. Targeting virally infected cells and cancer cells for destruction. And they can actually tell if a cell belongs to you or not. So what that means is if, if you've ever had a transplant or you know somebody who's had a transplant, and they have to be on immune suppressing medication, they're, they're suppressing natural killer cells as well as B cells and T cells. Okay. I clumped all these together because of their similar function. Mast cells are granular. They respond to parasites and allergens and they typically reside in tissue. Um, this is why if you have a, um, like a severe food allergen, like I do, um, you know that these live in your tissue because as soon as you eat something, you have that immediate reaction. 
because they just they just live in um, the mucosa of your mouth. Or if you have a bad allergic reaction to like cats, you know, they're living in your, your sinuses. There's also basophils and eosinophils, and they all store histamine, and they all participate in some degree to the allergic reaction. And there will be a separate lecture exclusively about the four types of allergic reaction. Monocytes don't have that important of a role, except that they are the underlying pool of cells that can turn into macrophages. They're baby macrophages. So under the microscope, they look like a sphere. They're not too exciting under a microscope. That's why they're called monocytes. Um, they are the second most populous. So uh, never let monkeys. They are the third most populous in your bloodstream. Two to 10% of the circulating white blood cells. Um, they're round in your blood. But when they get the signal to leave your blood and go to a tissue, they turn into a mature macrophage. So it's very much like a Pokemon evolution thing. Right. Macrophages, the grown-up mature monocyte. They can reside in tissue. Uh, they can be long-lived for an innate immune cell. They can live for months. They typically destroy through phagocytosis or eating, cell eating of infectious agents. And they're actually really good at communicating with the other parts of the immune system. They can attract other immune cells with cytokines and chemokines. There are descriptions of them coming up. And as I alluded to earlier, they interact with T cells. That's part of the adaptive immune system. And they do that most often in the lymph node. They can do this in tissue. So I did briefly describe antigen presentation earlier. Um, when a macrophage phagocytosis of bacteria, breaks it down the lysosome, and presents, it's incredibly small. It could be as small as 12 amino acids worth of a, you know, 200, 300 amino acid protein um, on the outside of their cell. But it's unique enough that it can still activate the T cells. Oops, you took it away. So here's phagocytosis. So you start off with this interesting yellow looking macrophage. Um, they're trying to show that it's mature by drawing these like little feelers out there. If this is a monocyte, it would just be a boring sphere, but it's definitely a mature macrophage. All right, so here's a micro, a bacteria. It's going to eat it. And when it eats it, pardon me, I'm getting a, this in the way. Oh no, that is unfortunate. Okay, apparently this is clickable. So the um, bacteria is phagocytosed and it meets up with the lysosome. The lysosome has a pH approximately the same as your stomach, a pH between one and two. And there's also enzymes. Enzymes to me are like the scissors of the cell. They typically, especially the digestive enzymes, they snap apart any protein into smaller pieces that is then dissolved with the acidic pH. So it's pretty deadly to all but the trickiest bacteria. Some of them have evolved to escape the lysosome. It's terrible. All right, so um, some of it gets removed from the macrophage body and then some of it will get placed on the outside surface. This is almost always how a macrophage is drawn. You've got your circle nucleus in the middle, and then it's drawn slightly blobby. At this point, you know, I wouldn't expect you to know most of these terms, um, but it's here to show you what a variety of proteins are on the outside of a macrophage. This is a fraction, just like 1% of what would really be on the outside of a macrophage. They can recognize mannose, which is a sugar found in bacteria. They can recognize glucan, similar process. Um, there's scavenger receptors. There's receptors for lipopolysaccharide, which is the outside of bacteria. There's also TLR4. It's another receptor for the outside of bacteria. 
So one of the most important themes in an innate immune cell is that it reflects what it's going to interact with. So if you can imagine, it's not going to be a great drawing, I'm prefacing that. Um, if you're going to run into a bacteria, what it's going to encounter first is the outside of the bacteria. And so it makes sense that the way that our immune cells developed is that the outside of a macrophage, it recognizes the outside of a bacteria, but the inside of a macrophage, it's no slouch either. The inside usually recognizes the inside of bacteria and viruses. So typically RNA and DNA is recognized inside of the cell in case the cell gets infected. And that concept, we're gonna come back to that concept many times. All right, so this is just showing, for example, how bacteria can bind to the macrophage and that initi initiates inflammation. Okay. When bacteria bind to receptors, they initiate inflammation. So here's like step one. I need to make that thinner. Step two would be typically making some changes here in the nucleus, causing the creation of cytokines and chemokines, just like step three. All right. And they're just showing down here, potentially the bacteria is also getting degraded in the lysosome, which is a concept we've covered two or three times now. Uh, so sometimes, and I mean professor, I do make my students memorize which toll-like receptors bind to what type of bacteria. This is a little bit more information than I would require, especially for toll-like receptor one and two. But the other ones, yeah. If you, if you become a microbiologist, if you become an immunologist, and study innate immune cells, you need to know these like the back of your hand. All right. So toll-like receptors are a family of receptors that bind to really common patterns in bacteria and viruses. Um, so let's start with the outside. This one's outside. And I've got a much better picture coming up. This is the outside, and this is the outside, and the others are inside. So the um, toll-like receptor one binds to the outside of most bacteria. Um, these are technical terms that a microbiologist would know, but I wouldn't expect an immunologist to know this at the moment. Um, yeah. And then these terms might be a little bit more familiar, RNA. So this one's inside. This can bind to double-stranded RNA. TLR9 is also inside, and it can bind to DNA. So um, DNA in our bodies is methylated in a unique pattern that pathogens don't have. So if it's unmethylated, um, your immune cells, like dendritic cells, like macrophages, can tell the difference between DNA from us and from a pathogen. It's all about patterns. That's what runs the innate immune system, genetically encoded patterns. All right, so let's talk to dendritic cells. They reside in tissue. They are long lived. They're probably the most long lived for innate immune cell. They got their name after star shaped. And they're also really good at what macrophages are really good at, attracting other immune cells and phagocytosis. They also interact with the adaptive immune system and migrate to the nearest lymph node during an infection. I think I might have a question coming up. Let me just double check before I step on my toes. No, I'm good. I'm going to back up. So why do you think your body would bother having both dendritic cells and macrophages? Just think about it for a second.
So it, it's probably that we need a backup system. Everybody needs a backup system. And they live in different locations. Macrophages have that pool of monocytes in the blood that they can pull from and traffic into tissue. Dendritic cells typically sit still in their tissue until they're needed. Um, so it's a combination of they live in different parts of the body and it's always good in biology to have a backup system. So these two slides are gonna show, it's a summary of what I showed you at the end of the second lecture, but it's good to revisit this concept because it's a core concept in immunology. All right, so let's say this is your skin, this is your epidermis, and then this is your dermis. And these pill looking things are bacteria. So let's say you cut yourself and the bacteria can now get past your physical barrier and your chemical barriers and directly access your tissue and blood. Bad news, but there are dendritic cells. This, this term here, Langerhans cell, that is um, the person who discovered them. So they can be called Langerhans cells, they can be called dendritic cells. Either way, they're here in your tissue and they're ready. So bacteria gets close enough to this dendritic cell that it binds to a toll-like receptor. This says, this is the outside of the bacteria. It's time to freak out now. So it probably ate the bacteria, broke it down, and then it traveled to a lymph node. This is it dramatically traveling to a lymph node. Still traveling to a lymph node. And now it's gotten to the T cell section, not the B cell section, that's none of their business. They interact with T cells. Um, and this concept is why we have autoimmune disease. It's why we have allergy. It's why we remember most of the colds we experience. Um, so this core concept, we're gonna go over many times in greater detail. Okay, tiny quiz. See if you remember. Which immune cell is responsible for allergic reactions or which immune cells are responsible? Yep, mast cell, basophil, eosinophil. Which immune cells are capable of phagocytosis? Yes, macrophages and dendritic cells. And are any of these infectious cells, or sorry, immune cells specific for one infectious agent? Nope. Ha ha, there's the neutrophil. Don't forget about that neutrophil. I mentioned it earlier. All right, so how else can immune cells fight? They can fight through cytokines and chemokines. Cytokines is the umbrella term. So a chemokine is a type of cytokine. It's um, Greek for cell movement, which is a little bit ironic because chemokines also are Greek for cell movement. <laughs> okay, so they're small proteins that modify the immune response. They can ramp up the immune response or they can suppress the immune response. Macrophages, these are like the classic ones. If you've ever tried to read an immunology paper on PubMed, I bet you've seen these three. IL stands for interleukin or between two white blood cells, which for some reason reminds me of between two ferns, but interleukin between two white blood cells. And then some of them are in order of their discovery. IL-1, IL-6, and then TNF is different. It stands for tumor necrosis factor alpha. This was discovered um, because when applied to cancer cells, it destroys them. No immune cells needed. Not to say that immune cells aren't critical for curing cancer, they are. But TNF alpha all by itself can destroy a cancer cell. All right. Uh, cytokines help activate immune cells to kill bacteria and viruses more efficiently, and they can directly kill bacteria and your own cells. Um, later on in the lectures, there will be specific diseases where 
some of these cytokines will play a really large role. All right, so chemokines have a different naming system. When I went to graduate school, nobody agreed on how to name them. So I learned, whatever, 20 different names of chemokines. And by the time I graduated, the scientific community had gotten together and come up with a unified naming system. So I had to relearn all of them. I was like, oh, great. Well, at least we all agree now. So chemokines are a family of proteins secreted by cells. This means they could be secreted by damaged tissue and not necessarily an immune cell. So their name is derived from their ability to direct chemotaxis. That means cell movement. Like they move to these. Cytokines could be doing things like killing bacteria, killing your own cells. But the primary function of chemokines is movement. That's the main reason to have it. Um, I'm, I'm going to wait a second and then I'll tell you a story. So most cell types can do this. This is not exclusive to immune cells. And if you think about the design of our bodies, this makes a lot of sense. Let's see. Here. Here. And I'll go back. When these cells are damaged, if they couldn't make chemicals to talk to the immune system, your body would lose valuable time. So if you had to wait for a macrophage or a dendritic cell to make chemokines, that wouldn't be very helpful. So the damaged tissue itself can make chemokines as well as the immune cells. So everybody in concert is saying, damage, damage, damage here. Please come respond to the damage here. <laughs> which speeds up the innate immune response. All right, so CCL2, which did not exist until I graduated from, with my PhD. I think we called it MIP2, I think so. So CCL2 attracts neutrophils and macrophages to the site of an infection. There are some people that have deficiencies in CCL2. There are also genetic mouse models where you can remove CCL2. And you know what? It's terrible. It's terrible um, because bacteria get to have hours or days to make copies of themselves and kill cells. And it just takes so long for the neutrophils and macrophages to make it to the infection with the right number of like enforcements, reinforcements to fight that, I mean, it, it can be fatal. And every infection is a serious infection and not just a little cut. So chemokines are really important. Okay. This is a summary. Let me move my face. All right. You've seen this a few times now. Let's put it together. Tissue. Bacteria on the tissue. The tissue is damaged. The tissue now has access, or the bacteria now has access to your bloodstream and deeper tissue, where macrophages and dendritic cells can live for days to months. They are going to bind, usually with some type of toll like receptor, to a bacteria. That starts the internal process of inflammation. The inflammation is going to call in additional immune cells, and it's going to cause the trafficking of some of these immune cells to a lymph node to activate T cells, which then activate B cells. So over here, they've drawn that. They've drawn antibodies as if um, B cells were activated. They've even drawn some physical B cells here, and T cells would arrive as well. Oh boy. All right. This is an important concept. I'm trying to figure out when to show the video. I'm going to show it now. Okay. This is one of my favorite videos. If you type in leukocyte rolling, I think it's the third video. 
And I've been talking about how there's monocytes in the blood and how when they leave the blood and enter the tissue, they turn into a macrophage. But how does that happen? It's called leukocyte rolling adhesion. And they're going to show it first in cartoon and then in, in a live animal. Telial cells then express surface proteins called selectins. Selectins bind to carbohydrates displayed on the membrane of the leukocytes, causing them to stick to the walls of the blood vessels. This binding interaction is of sufficiently low affinity that the leukocytes can literally roll along the vessel walls in search for points to exit the vessel. There, they adhere tightly and squeeze between endothelial cells without disrupting the vessel walls. Yeah. So if you think about cells, think about their cytoskeleton. They've had all of this structure called actin, making them a sphere. They can collapse all of that and turn as flat as like a little cellular pancake. It's crazy. Then crawl out of the blood vessel into the adjacent connective tissue. Here, Lucas. Oh, shoot. I'm going to go back just one second. I know I'm going to step on my own toes. Right here, these orange dots, these orange dots are most likely representative of CCL2 or a similar type of chemokine. Here, leukocyte rolling is observed directly in an anesthetized mouse. What is really the up and down movement of the frame is due to the mouse's breathing. Two blood vessels are shown. The upper one is an artery with blood flowing from right to left. The lower one is a vein with blood flowing from left to right. Leukocytes only adhere to the surface of veins. They do not crawl out of arteries. But yeah, that's, that's incredible. It's just proof of how this works in a real animal. So you can see here, this one's rolling. It's probably going to do the whole pancake thing and squish between two cells to enter the tissue. These are one, two, three immune cells already in the tissue and probably fighting whatever they need to fight. I will um, put a link to this leukocyte rolling video in the um, description box. Going to have to scroll all the way down. All right, so this is the last concept for lecture three. It is a complicated concept. All right. Okay. So it's similar to the video, but it's like we've zoomed in more. They're showing bacteria again. Bacteria is sort of like the standard, um, imagine the immune system is working thing, at least when you're beginning immunology. So let's see, we've got bacteria here in the standard pill format and they're triggering macrophages to release cytokines and chemokines. That's going to draw in other immune cells. So here we're getting a neutrophil. Uh, we'll be getting another macrophage over here. This even could have been this blue monocyte. Oh, they're showing a blue monocyte coming in on the third panel. This would then differentiate into a um, macrophage. Unless they're drawing it as a T cell. There is a small amount of T cells. I remember, never let monkeys sow their lymphocytes. So it's either a monocyte or a T cell. Either way, they've all been called to help this particular macrophage who used chemokines to call them. That process is called vasodilation. You just see this little, these gaps? Ooh, that let me zoom in more than I thought. These gaps allow in fluids. So your tissue typically doesn't have that many fluids. And when the blood opens up just a little bit to allow for the immune cells to come through, fluids come through as well. And so do proteins contained in the blood. And all of that leads to vasodilation. Um, the blood vessels nearby get wider. They're dilating. Um, and then more fluids going into the tissue causing swelling, redness, and heat. 
But all of that is beneficial to help the inflammatory cells migrate into tissue. All right, so the migration has a couple of steps. The video is way cooler than just looking at it here um, now, but that's okay. There's two types of binding. So it's a little bit like stop, drop, and roll when, you know, kids learn how to put out fires if for some reason their backpack caught on fire or something. All right. So there's gentle binding and strong binding. I'm going to skip to this and then we're going to travel back. This is the easiest way to remember it. There are weak bonds they're called selectins. And then there's strong bonds and they're called integrins. So I, I made this myself. Um, you have to think about it in two parts. What is happening to the blood vessels? What is happening to the immune cells? So these are the four parts of leukocyte rolling adhesion. Selectins bind to um, a protein, or it's, sorry, it's carbohydrate called Sialolewis. So here, this is the first step in rolling adhesion. It's weak right here, weak. And it allows the leukocytes to start to slow down because they're in your blood. They're coming through rapidly. And here they're slowing down. When each time there's a weak bond, it's slower and slower. And as long as it's going slow enough, a strong bond with an integrin can happen. Okay, so let's take another example. We have this monocyte. Um, one of the classic features of a monocyte is a kidney bean shaped nucleus. They're drawing that here for you now. If you ever work in a lab or at a hospital, you're welcome. Kidney bean shape. All right, so here's the monocyte. It's got the carbohydrate in yellow, Sialo Lewis, binding to a selectin. So it's slowing down. And it's slow enough that the second thing is going to happen. Here's a strong bond. So we have um, the integrins binding to, they're usually called um, different types of CAM molecules, like ICAM or VCAM, and we'll go over that in just a minute. But yeah, so weak bond slows it down and allows for a tight bond. When the tight bond happens, they get the signal to move between two blood vessel cells. See it squishing through here? And then it's turned into a macrophage. So that's exactly what would happen. There's this big transformation from an immature monocyte to a mature macrophage as it passes through the tissue. It's like getting ready to fight bacteria and viruses. Okay, so what I would tell my students, like, don't, don't worry about this too much. Um, so what you would need to know is that they're carbohydrates and the name and then what they bind to. So P-selectin binds to Sialo Lewis, but I have all of that in my uh, summary figure. Integrins, they are strong. That's what you need to know here. They're strong. They are on macrophages, neutrophils, dendritic cells, just exactly the immune cells we've been talking about. And they bind to ICAMs. In different parts of the body, they bind to VCAMs. So what are they called? They're actually an immunoglobulin superfamily because they happen to share um, similarities to antibodies. Um, as I said, there's ICAMs, there's a couple of different families, there's VCAMs, and they're just distributed in slightly different parts of the body. So this is um, kind of putting it together. This is a neutrophil. This is some type of blood vessel-y thing. Um, and they're binding to either um, ICAMs or VCAMs. 
and slowing down. So if you're having trouble piecing this together, I would recommend trying to draw it out yourself. So both the weak bonds and the strong bonds and thinking about what's on the blood vessels, selectins and ICAMs, what is on the immune cells, the carbohydrate, Cialo Lewis, and the integrin. All right, that's my summary. And I do always have to give a shout out to Crash Course, their animation is is just superior um so they do have a good walkthrough on innate immune cells but they don't do a lot of detail and certainly not exam level detail all right that is it for lecture three and ideally my voice will stay here with us and i can record something for friday all right see ya